So the uh, interpretation of Genesis 6 that uh, the Christian church has adopted ever since uh, pretty much um, you know, Julius Africanus, uh, uh, Justin, uh, rather uh, uh, Augustine, uh, uh, the, the, in the 6th century or 5th century, uh, has been the, the line of Seth uh, and uh, the line of Cain. And uh, you're going back then to the, the earlier interpretation held by the, uh, the Jewish rabbis and the, the early church fathers, uh, and, and the, the view then espoused by uh, the likes of Chuck Missler, Mike Heiser, and so forth, that uh, Genesis 6 uh, is to be taken literally, that there were giants in the land in those days. I was actually raised to take the Bible literally, <laughs> and I think you really have a big problem if you go the, the Seth route. Um, for, for one thing, you can't really... I used to always say growing up that, uh, and I was kind of taught this, that you can't just read the Bible. You have to study it because it wasn't written in English for one thing. Mm -hmm. So you lose a lot if all you're reading is English because the English language, just by comparison to the Greek and even worse when you compare it to the Hebrew, it's bankrupt. You know, It just can't um, describe as well as as, uh, the Greek and the Hebrew does. And in the Hebrew it says the Ben Elohim, which is used in other places, uh, like when Lucifer uh, presents himself in the book of Job. You mm-hmm. know, it's clearly, as you read in the book of Job, it's the angels. So why would you view it as the angels in Job, but not in Genesis, even more so uh, when they start talking about giants? You know, if, if it was just Cain and Seth's deal, how, how do you get giants? Yeah, and in fact, we were just watching some videos of uh, Chuck Missler's on this teaching um, Things that we watched about ten years ago, um, you know, on uh, TV today, we plugged uh, Sharon's laptop into our our TV so we could watch it like you know on a real screen instead of on. You get to our age, Rob. You know, we're a little older than you are. The eyes start to go a little bit, so you know, the big screen is helpful. Um, sure. The uh, so so how does this paradigm, this divine council paradigm, where you've got uh, the fallen angels who rebelled against God, um, and the contamination of the uh, the human genome, the bloodline, uh, in, in their attempt to destroy. Uh, well, to, to destroy the bloodline from which the Messiah will come. How, how does that form the, the basis of, uh, of seed? Well, uh, if you look right from the beginning there, when, when they're trying to destroy, if you're talking about the bloodline, uh, they're, uh, they're trying to destroy the bloodline that would lead to the Messiah. And when uh, God is looking down at the earth and he sees Noah, uh, Scripture says that he is found upright and just and righteous in his generation. It was like three synonyms there. So upright and just, yeah, he was a good guy. But in the Hebrew, righteous in his generation could literally be translated pure in his genetics. Mm-hmm. And so if you're, you're looking at Noah and his wife, and God's looking at the whole earth, and, and those were only two left that that he could bring his Messiah through, he had to preserve them. And if you consider Noah and his wife being pure, then obviously well, his sons were pure too. But Scripture says there were giants in the land in those days and also afterward, afterwards meaning after the flood. So, and that starts showing up in Ham's lineage um, right away, within 100 years after the flood. So I look at that and say, well, if Noah and his wife were pure and the sons were pure, then must, there must have been some kind of dormant Nephilim genetics or something uh, in the wives, or at least in Ham's wife, because you just look at the four children of Ham, and, and they're loaded with giants. Um, Ham had Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And, of course, we know that Canaan uh, settled what we call the Holy Land, uh, Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, those were all the ites that Joshua and everybody else had to wipe out. They were all giants. And they walked and they said, we're like grasshoppers compared to these people. And they're pretty huge. Um, but something I found really interesting was kind of diving into Mizraim's lineage. Uh, Mizraim is Egypt. And one of his sons was Kaftor, uh, the Kaftorites. Oh, right. Says, from whom came the Philistines. Right. Now, if you look up uh, Jeremiah 47.4, and uh, I believe it's Amos 9.7, it talks about the Kaftorites settled in Crete, which I find really interesting because we know that, if, that he's the father of the Philistines, of which Goliath, you know, one of the most famous giants, came. Um, you know, he settles in Crete, and Crete's where all the Greek mythology originated from. Hmm. You know, you, all of Greek mythology comes out of Crete. In fact, I was amazed to see just how much of you know what we would now call Europe uh, was subject to this tiny little island. How is that? You know, but huh. if you consider characters like 
Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades might have been hanging out there, uh, it starts to make some sense. So what, what do you draw from that? What conclusion do you draw? Well, uh, one of the things that I hope that Seed will help to show is where a lot of the mythology comes from. Um, there's a uh, History Channel special that was on recently uh, on the gods, and mm-hmm. of course everybody focuses right on Zeus. You know, he's he's kind of the, the big one. Uh, and this whole, you know, it's like an hour-long special on Zeus and how he literally ruled the ancient world for 3,000 years. I mean, nobody could touch Zeus, you know. Mm-hmm. And it says, but there was one challenger that he didn't count on. And then it, the commentator makes the statement, Jesus Christ. And huh. I just, I was thinking about that because if you think one of the um, wonders of the ancient world was the Temple of Zeus. Right, right. And then the Temple of Zeus is this huge, 50-foot high, you know, gold statue, this massive, muscular guy, bearded guy with lightning bolts, you know, that ruled with an iron fist for 3,000 years. And then you think of Jesus, you know, this this humble carpenter from Nazareth. And that he toppled Zeus's regime, you know, after 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there's a trip that my uh, my wife and I, we weren't married at the time, but we went to uh, Israel in 2005. And we, if you've ever been, have you been to the Holy Land? I have not, no. Oh, it's amazing because it's such a small country and literally everywhere you go, something happened, you know. Uh, <laughs> and there's, it's really, you know, it's like, wow, this is where David, you know, we got to pick up stones in the, the brook or whatever where they believe David picked up five smooth stones and, Sleep. It's amazing after 3,000 years there are any stones left. In yeah, right, everybody going there to pick up stones. <laughs> yeah. But one of the places that impacted me the most was um, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, and th- there's a passage in the scriptures that I could never understand, and it's where Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, and he asks the question, who do you say that I am? And the disciples say, well, you know, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets, whatever. You know, they're all saying all these different people. And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus gets extremely excited by that, mm-hmm. that, that answer. And he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. You know, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail, and I'm going to give you the king, keys to the kingdom. And, you know, it's like, Wow. Jesus gets real excited about that, but I could never understand that because that's the end of his ministry. Mm -hmm. When at the beginning of his ministry, Nathaniel said the same thing. You are the son of God. And he says, why? Because I saw you under the fig tree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're going to see greater things than that. And every time the the demon-possessed people saw him, they said the same thing. They they cried out, you are the son of God. And he would tell them, be quiet. So I'm thinking, you know, even when he he was a baby, they prophesied over him that he was the son of God. Uh, you know, in the temple. And so it's like, okay, literally from his birth to the beginning of his ministry and all through his ministry, they called him the Son of God. So why is it such a big deal when Peter said it? And I could never understand that until I actually stood in the location where that conversation took place. And that conversation took place in front of the altar to the Greek god Pan, which was yes. at the base of Mount Hermon. Right. And, and this is so significant on, on so many levels because First of all, Pan was the Greek god of shepherds. And so right there you've got the good shepherd standing mm-hmm. in front of the Greek god of shepherds. I think that's just kind of neat. Mm-hmm. But if I, was, if I was shooting the scene you know, with a camera, I could see Jesus with his back to the altar of Pan. It was kind of like a, a miniature Petra type thing. If you can imagine, like it's all embedded in a cliff, mm-hmm. you know, like the, the city in the Petra. And if you can imagine Jesus with his back to, the, to all this altar thing, and Peter's looking at Jesus, and I could see kind of it's like a rack focus where Peter's got Jesus in focus, and all of a sudden he looks over his shoulder and sees Pan. Pan comes into focus, Jesus goes out of focus. And then Pan goes out of focus, and Jesus comes back into focus, and Peter goes, oh, I get it. You are the son of the living God. Mm-hmm. That's right, Peter. Not these, you know, upon this rock I'm going to build my church, not these, this rock behind me, you know. I am the living God. I'm not a rock, a God made of stone, you know what I mean? But what was even more significant about that conversation was just off to Jesus' left was an actual place known in the ancient world, in, even today, is known as the Gates of Hades. Hmm. Now, now, what's interesting to me about that is Hades is not just a place, it's a person. Hades is the brother of Zeus. 
you know, the guardian of the underworld. And just off to Jesus' right, or the other side, depending on which way you're looking at it, um, was a foothill, and at the top of the foothill was the fortress of Nimrod, who really? was the first Antichrist. Yeah, right at the top there's a little foothill. And do you have Google Earth? Yeah. Oh, I can send you some, some uh, coordinates. Yeah, send me the coordinates. I'm really curious about this. Now, I, I knew about the Grotto of Pan and, at the foot of Mount yeah. Hermon. I talked with Judd Burton about this uh, uh, a couple of months ago, and it, it was really the first time I'd heard about that. Um, so the, you're right. The location is very significant, but I'd not heard about the Fortress of Nimrod right there, which is really Yeah, it, it's literally – if you were looking at the Altar of Pan, off to your left would be the Gates of Hades, and just off up to your right, it was a foothill. Uh, you know, Mount Hermon's actually a, a, a whole mountain range, um, and there's like a little foothill just off to the right, and at the top of it is the Fortress of Nimrod. I mean, Nimrod's the first Antichrist who tried to create a one-world system without God. Right. In fact, he wanted to kill God. So it's pretty significant that Jesus has this discussion right there, especially when you consider his destination was Jerusalem. You know, he's at the end of his ministry. He knows what he's got to do. So why does he take a detour and go all the way to the very top of Israel to have this conversation? Yeah, the foot of Mount Hermon, sure. At the, and I believe that the significance of that is Mount Hermon. 